Just last April, he spent three days at the college, visiting classes, talking with film and creative writing students and faculty, and giving a reading from recent fiction. So this talk tonight is the third date that Ron has had with the college so far. We're not yet going steady, uh, but in my experience, we can call three dates our relationship. <laughs> Ron is on campus this evening to help celebrate the life and the work of one of the greatest poets of the modern era, the Jesuit priest, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who, as David mentioned, died 125 years ago, 1889. Tonight, Ron will speak on the relationship between Hopkins and the poet editor Robert Bridges, both of whom feature in Ron's novel, Exiles. And I believe he's also reading from that novel. Ron Hansen is the Gerard Manley Hopkins SJ professor in the arts and sciences at Santa Clara University. He's the author of eight novels, an essay collection, and two short story collections, including his most recent, She Loves Me Not, New and Selected Stories. His fiction has gathered critical praise since publication of his first novel, Desperados, in 1979. His novels, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford and Atticus, were finalists for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Atticus was also a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction. He's received a Guggenheim Fellowship, an award in literature from the American Academy and National Institute of Arts and Sciences, I'm sorry, Arts and Letters, and two National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowships. In 2010, he received the Marianist Award from the University of Dayton and the Society of Mary for, quote, works both of fiction and nonfiction that help illuminate the relationship between faith and literature. Also in 2010, he received the Denise Levertov Award from the journal Image and the Seattle Pacific University for literary work that exemplifies a serious and sustained engagement with the Judeo-Christian tradition. Ron Hansen's novel, Exiles, interweaves two narratives. The story of five Franciscan nuns exiled from Bismarck's Germany as a result of the fault laws, who perished in a shipwreck off the coast of England in 1875. And the story of Gerard Manley Hopkins' life as a Jesuit and a poet, in particular his response to the tragic death of the nuns, which reached fullest expression in his great poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland. Ron's novel is about faith, loyalty, struggle, and creativity twin miracles of life and death. It's a novel about the transience of life and the mystery and beauty infusing every moment we breathe. To my mind, Ron Hansen's fiction shares many qualities with the poems of Gerard Mary Hopkins, which are a complex blend of the temporal and the transcendent, solid physicality and the metaphysics of belief and even Hopkins' words appear to have physical bodies, in part because of their intense sonic and rhythmic qualities so beautifully apparent in the wreck of the Deutschland. In Hansen's novels, as in Hopkins' poems, the physical world is richly manifest in details, textures, sights, and sounds. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, Hopkins writes in one of his greatest sonnets, God's grandeur. The world charged with energy and meaning, but the verb charged also suggests a mission and an obligation and an accusation. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. For me, this rich line helps explain the power of the novel Exiles, a world Ron Hansen created with language charged with energy and meaning and above all, with veneration for the sound and feel of the word on the page. To illustrate this, let me read a short passage from Exiles, describing what Sister Henrika, one of the Franciscan nuns who died on the Deutschland, notices while walking on the deck before the launch from Bremerhaven Harbor. Seamen shouted to each other in their hectic work on the ship and dock and many passengers were rushing up from steerage 
in order to watch the launch. She noticed on the weeded land slips of the shore that zephyrs were scudding little clouds of the morning's snow dust and the fine flakes sparkled in the sun as they rose. Along the dock, the snow was gliding over the tarred planks in white wisps that between trailing and flying shifted and wimpled like so many silvery worms. Attentive readers will pause at the word wimpled, remembering Hopkins, Hopkins's use of wimpling in his sign of the wind over. How the falcon of the poem, quote, rung upon the rain of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Indeed, in exiles, the novelist's language regularly and subtly echoes the poet's language. Two thirds of the way through exiles, Ron Hansen quotes a letter by Hopkins to the poet Richard Watson Dixon in June of 1878. The world is full of things and events, phenomena of all sorts, that go without notice, go unwitnessed. We are very lucky to have writing in America today a novelist dedicated to noticing and witnessing for his readers what has happened and is happening in our world. Please join me in welcoming Ron Hansen. Children, there was still enough of an inheritance that a job and a livelihood were never middle. 
with some questions for him. And for much of his life, he was a gentleman of leisure. His fine features were called patrician, and he was considered so stunningly handsome that there were Oxford classmates who could not take their eyes off him and thought him the possessor of the most beautiful face ever seen in a man. Sixty years later, his obituary in the London Times still spoke of his great stature and high, fine proportions, his leonine head, deep eyes, expressive lips, and a full-toned voice made more effective by a slight occasional hesitation in his speech. He was over six feet tall and wide-shouldered, a man's man who played football and cricket and was the lead oarsman for his college rowing team. And if he was cold, secretive, aggressively intolerant, and given, as an associate later wrote, to petulant exhibitions of rudeness, he was also generous, romantic, soft-hearted, considerate, and was fond of friendship, good wine, and mirth. In many ways, Hopkins and Bridges were opposites, just, but in just as many ways, they were destined to be friends. They were both beautifully educated intellectuals studying classical languages, both endorsed the aesthetic principles of the Oxford professors John Ruskin and Walter Pater. Both deeply admired pre-Raphaelite art, Elizabethan poetry, William Shakespeare, John Milton, and the 17th century English composer Henry Purcell. And they generally deplored the same things. Hopkins was a good enough artist to have made it his profession, as two of his younger brothers did. He was particularly adept at sketching nature scenes. Bridges was highly musical, playing piano and violin, and would later compose songs for the Yattenden Hymnal that are standards of liturgies of the Church of England even now. Hopkins combined academic excellence and a sharp, penetrating mind with a love of mischief and puns. Bridges was gifted in the natural sciences, articulate in his criticisms, interestingly opinionated, and was, as one man wrote, delightfully grumpy. Bridges' stepfather was Reverend Dr. John Molesworth, an esteemed and wealthy Anglican clergyman. And since the age of 10, Robert Bridges' home had been the vicarage at Rochdale in Lancashire. Two of Bridges' older sisters would marry clergymen. Another sister joined an Anglican priory of the Sisters of Mercy. And at Eton, Bridges was a high church boy who entertained the idea of priestly ordination. But Bridges and his stepfather were hardly close. Robert's scant mentions of him in his letters are generally sarcastic. And by the time he went to Oxford, his religious practice was social and formulaic. He fulfilled the churchly requirements of an English gentleman, who by the time he graduated, he was an agnostic, and in his 60s would look back on his earlier ecclesiastical attractions as ludicrous. Winston Churchill once said of himself, I could hardly be called a pillar of the church, I am more in the nature of a buttress, for I support it from the outside. <laughs> Bridges would likely not have disassociated, disassociated himself from that rather complacent aphorism. With Gerard Hopkins, Christianity was still central. At Highgate School, he ignored the ridicule of his classmates in order to keep a promise to his mother to read chapters of the New Testament each day. As an Oxford freshman, he became involved in the high church group organized by Reverend Henry Lydon, who sought to institute solemn liturgical ritual in, in Anglican services and to oppose the rationalism and theological liberalism that was emigrating from Germany by, as he put it, reasserting and insisting upon the whole area of the Catholic faith. Each Sunday night, Hopkins attended Reverend Lydon's Tea, Toast, and Testament lectures at St. Edmund Hall where he probably first met Bridges, and he began recording his sins and scruples in a confessional journal, a habit not unlike the not the examination of conscience he would later practice as a Jesuit. Writing to a friend, Hopkins ind indicated that he felt Roman Catholicism paradoxically intensified and subjectively destroyed what he called the sordidness of things. And he felt that would be enough inducement to lead many people to the Roman Catholic Church. The legitimacy of Anglican dogma and sacraments, particularly that of High Communion, became a worry to him. The Sunday sermons he had heard filled them, him with contempt, and he thought of religious asceticism and even eternal punishment as ways of correcting the triviality of this life. 
He read Apologia Pro Vita Sua, John Henry Newman's autobiographical account of his own religious conversion to the Church of Rome, and felt he found a kindred spirit. Friend noted in his journal entry of July 24, 1866, walked out with Hopkins and he confided to me his fixed intention of going over to Rome. I did not argue with him, as his grounds did not admit of argument. Within a few weeks, Hopkins was writing a letter to the Oxford alumnus Reverend Dr. John Henry Newman at his oratory in Birmingham, saying he was anxious to become a Roman Catholic. Quote, I do not want to be helped to any conclusions of belief, he wrote, for I am thankful to say my mind is made up. But the necessity of becoming a Catholic coming upon me suddenly has put me into painful confusion of mind about my immediate duty and my circumstances. Hopkins was accepted in the Roman Catholic Church by Reverend Newman on Sunday, October 21st, 1866. Expatriation might have been received with greater equanimity. Hearing the news, Manly Hopkins sorrowfully wrote his son, O oh, Gerard, my darling boy, are you indeed gone from me? Reverend Edgar Pusey, a, re a professor of divinity at Oxford, nastily wrote his student that he was a pervert. And in a letter to Florence Nightingale, Benjamin Jowett, Hopkins' tutor, referred to him as one of those three foolish fellows at our college who have gone over to Rome. It was to Bridges that Hopkins first confided that in his, on his Easter retreat he would try to decide if he had a vocation to the priesthood. In 1868, even as, as he was heading to the novitiate of the Society of Jesus in southwest London, Hopkins stressed that there would be no impediment to their continued communications. But there were. Bridges enrolled as a student at St. Bartholomew's Hospital Medical School in London in November 1869. His professional studies so occupied him that he seems to have visited his friend in the novitiate only once. And then either Bridges' profound distrust of the Jesuits, which was shared by much of Britain, or Hopkins' pedantic tendency to patronize in matters of faith and morals must have incited a chill into the friendship, for there is a gap of a year and a half in which we have no correspondence. At last, in 1871, when Hopkins had taken his first vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and had gone up to the Jesuit Stonyhurst College in Lancashire to study the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, he wrote his dearest bridges apologetically. I hear nothing whatever of you, and fault is certainly mine. I'm going to address this to Rochdale, because you may have changed your lodgings in town. I shall not write more now, indeed I have nothing to say. Please tell me all about yourself. I'm sure I must have behaved unkindly when you came to Roehampton. I'm going to skip again. Hopkins was stunned in January 1874 when he was reading an issue of the literary journal, The Academy, and found on page 53 a review of poems by Robert Bridges, an author praised for, quote, a fancy that can be strange when it chooses, and has always a power of delicate surprise, simplicity, courtliness, feeling, music of no vulgar order. The medical student had been so secretive about writing poetry that a hurt that somewhat humiliated Hopkins sent an affectionate letter wondering if this Robert Bridges was indeed his old friend. Did I ever before see anything of yours, Hopkins wrote? I cannot remember. Whether Bridges replied is uncertain. Ever concerned about his privacy and possibly embarrassed by his snappish views, Bridges destroyed his side of the correspondence in his old age. But we can at least guess that Hopkins' chagrin over being kept in the dark about the poems and the pain he must have felt as seeing his friend having accomplished what had long been for him a hobby and an aspiration. The year before Hopkins was born, his father published The Philosopher's Stone and other poems. And when Gerard was five, his uncle and father collaborated on a book of poems entitled Pietas Metrica. At Highgate School, Gerard had won an exhibition scholarship to Oxford based on a prize poem entitled Escorial. Describing in 15 stanzas, stanzas 
the conquest of a famous Spanish palace, monastery, and church. And at Oxford, he'd written perhaps a hundred poems, some of which he burned before joining the Society of Jesus, symbolically stating in that so-called massacre of the innocents that he'd given up one vocation for another. And yet he continually spoke about poetic form and diction when he and Bridges were together. Combined with his happiness over his friend's achievement, there must have been a measure of envy and a worry that he had been superseded. In December 1874, Bridges took his final written, oral, and clinical examinations in therapeutics, medicine, surgery, midwifery, forensic medicine, and hygiene, and in the next month, commenced work as a house physician at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London with a salary of a paltry 25 pounds per year, which would not have covered nine months' rent of a room at Oxford. Hopkins was, by then in northern Wales, at the Theologian of St. Plano's, where his studies so preoccupied him that he recalled taking Aristotle's metaphysics from the library shelf and promptly putting it back, recognizing there would be no free time in which to read it. And he still felt that poetry and writing would interfere with my state and vocation. But then on December 7th, 1875, the Deutschland, a German immigrant ship steaming from Bremen to America, ran aground on a notoriously treacherous sandbank in the Thames estuary, and 50 of the crew and passengers were drowned, including five Franciscan nuns who were exiled from their homeland by Bismarck's anti-Catholic laws. The 31-year-old theology student later wrote that, quote, I was affected by the account and happening to say so to my rector. He said that he wished someone would write a poem on the subject. On this hint, I set to work, and though my hand was on it first, produced one. I had long had haunting my ear the echo of a new rhythm which I now realized on paper. In the 35 standards of, stanzas of the record of the Deutschland, Hopkins joined the heroic and elusive elements of the Greek choral ode with a then common genre, the sea disaster poem, that was popularized in 1839 by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Wreck of the Hesperus. But its originality lay in intricacies of its allegory and symbolism, the surprising vigor and invention of its vocabulary, and its haunting religious vision, which Hopkins links himself the five nuns in Christ each committed to serving others, and each accepting exile, desolation, and misery. Quite unlike Hopkins' lyric poems at Oxford, which seemed principally inspired by Keats, the record of the Deutschland and the sonnets that were to follow it were experimental, passionate, non-imitative, and written in sprung rhythm, a speech-based prosody, which, as he wrote another po poet, consists in scanning by accents and stresses alone without any account of the number of souls. Submitting the poem to the British Jesuit periodical The Month, Hopkins heard at first it was accepted for the July issue, but a sub-editor was then asked to look at it, and he later recalled that, quote, the only result was to give me a very bad headache, and to leave me to hand back the poem to Father Coleridge with the remark that it was indeed unreadable. Stingingly rejected by editors of his own religious order, Hopkins sought no other audience for the Wreck of the Deutschland until 1877, when Bridges sent him Carmen Elegiacum, a privately published Latin poem of farewell to a hospital mentor, along with a sequence of 24 Shakespearean sonnets entitled The Growth of Love, about Dr. Bridges' wooing of a mystery woman who seemed to have died on one. Weekly community encounters within the Society of Jesus, so-called fraternal collections, had instilled in Hopkins the invaluable gift of candor, and he was frank in his criticisms, writing that parts of the Latin poem Carmen Elegiacum were damned and obscure, and that he looked upon its costly printing as, quote, a waste of time and money. About the growth of love, he was more encouraging, quote, in general, I do not think that you've reached finality and point of execution. Words might be chosen with more point and propriety. Images might be more brilliant, etc. But he found a good deal of beauty in the book and generously praised Bridges for his, quote, manly tenderness and flowing and never failing music. As John Shores Ritz points out, it is remarkable to see how from the very first letters in which Hopkins gives his opinion on Bridges' poems, 
He expresses himself with masterly propriety. There is no conceit, no pride. The remarks are always to the point, but under the kindness or the abruptness lies the virile self-conviction of a teacher. Included with his letter to Bridges was a handwritten copy of the Wreck of the Deutschland, and Bridges bluntly responded to it with his own surly criticisms. Finding fault with the poem's rhymes, the presumptuous jugglery of its sprung rhythm, which he parodied, its oddity and obscurity, and the errors of taste in its metaphors. He added that no amount of money could persuade him to read the epic again. <laughs> the friendship might have been lastingly damaged by the critical exchange, but Hopkins replied to Bridges' letter with a tranquil mixture of wit, humility, and the sturdy confidence of genius. And when the Jesuit visited his family near London that summer, he and Bridges got together for a pleasant dinner, reminiscence, and serious conversations about poetry. This was, after all, 1877, the honest mirabilis of Hopkins' life, the year not only of a September ordination to the priesthood, but of ten miraculous poems. God's grandeur, the star starlight night, as kingfishers catch fire, spring, the sea and the skylark, in the valley of the Elwe, the wind hover, pie of beauty, hurrahing and harvest, and the lantern out of doors. Robert Bridges' poetry starkly contrasted with those of his friend, both in his orthodox, archaic style, his metrical precision, and his skeptical, modernist themes. Whereas Hopkins employed an unconventional vocabulary, a met metrical play, to express his Masonic threads, God's grandeur, the electrical presence of a holy being imminent even in a denatured industrial world. English lit literature owes Robert Bridges a great debt for his responsible pacey of the handwritten poems of his friend into a blank book as he got them, for Hopkins himself was notoriously nonchalant about their preservation. But Bridges at first seemed to consider the poems the outlandish experiments of a crude amateur and was never wholly at ease with his friend's work. Sending the album of Hopkins' poetry to Coventry Patmore much later, Bridges inserted a note saying, I have some misgivings lest I may have spoken too warmly of these poems and prepared your mind for a disappointment, lest you should be, be ill-prepared that these poems, these poems I should tell you, Lest you should be ill-prepared for these poems, I should tell you that Gerard Hopkins is affected in style. His affectation is somewhat natural to him, however, and subservient to the general effect. Looking at poems by Bridges and Hopkins and on similar themes, we can discern why Hopkins seemed affected in style to the doctor, for there was a wide chasm that separated the friends in terms of talent, and what was new and inventive in Hopkins just seemed wrong to the more conventional poet whose rhyme schemes were careful but unsurprising, and his vocabulary as flat as greeting card verse. <laughs> the vigor of Hopkins' language and the forceful projection of emotion have no equivalence in Robert Bridges' poetry. Hopkins does not conclude with a wagging finger as Bridges does sometimes. He simply has a pain to let his few readers know how it feels to experience dark moods. The lost are like this, and their scourge to be, as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. I have taught this poem, I awake and feel. I taught this poem, and it takes about an hour to do it justice. A class could solve Robert Bridges' name of melancholia on a similar theme in about five minutes. <laughs> Writing of a selection in the poem, Poets and Poetry of the Century, some years after Hopkins' death, Bridges again struggled to find anything good to say of his friend's poetry. His early verse, he noted, shows a mastery of keysy and sweetness, but he soon developed a very different style of his own, so full of experiments in rhythm and diction that were his poems collected into one volume, it would appear, appear as a unique effort in English literature. Most of his poems are religious and marked with Catholic theology, and almost all are injured by a natural eccentricity, a love for subtlety and uncommonness, well denoted by the Greek term for extravagance, excess. And this quality of mind hampered their author throughout life. For though to a fine intellect and varied accomplishments, he united humor, great personal charm, and the most attractive virtues of a tender and sympathetic nature, which won for him, him love wherever he went and gave him zeal for his work. 
yet he was not considered publicly successful in his profession, unquote. Even in his editorial notes on Hopkins' collected poems of 1918, which he, as editor, titled identically to his own first book, Bridges could not forgive his friend's licenses. He wrote, quote, apart from questions of taste, and if these poems were to be arraigned for errors of what may be called taste, they might be convicted of an occasional affectation in metaphor, or of some perversion of human feeling. These and a few such examples are mostly efforts to force emotion into theological or sectarian channels. Or again, there is the exaggerated Marianism of such some pieces, or the naked encounter of sensualism and asceticism. Unquote. Bridges disliked, quote, all the rude shocks of his purely artistic wantonness, definite faults of style which a reader must have courage to face, and a disconcerting lack of literary decorum. Reading Bridges' notes in Hopkins' poems in 1920, a reviewer of poetry exclaimed, from our best friends, deliver us, O oh Lord. <laughs> because Bridges got rid of this half of the correspondence, we have only Hopkins' letters as a guide to their conversations on literature. We see in those letters that Hopkins could be just as merciless in his commentaries of Bridges' work, saying of his play, The Feast of Bacchus, the Menandrian period appears to be the dullest and narrowest word that one could choose to lay an action in, a jaded and baited civilization. Moreover, I have a craving for more brilliancy, more picturesque, more local color. However, you austerely set these things aside. I am to take the play for what it is. In its kind, then, which has for me no attraction, and in its meter, which has to me no beauty, I think it a masterpiece. <laughs> More often we see the priest begging Hopkins for heartening words. I must absolutely have encouragement as much as crops rain. But he was quick to detect falseness or condescension. It gave me, of course, great comfort to read your words of praise. But however, praise or blame, Never mingle your criticisms, monstrous and indecent spiritual compliments. Quarreling with Bridges' finicky, old-fashioned qualms, Hopkins justified his poetry by saying, with some prescience, if the whole world agreed to condemn it or see nothing in it, I should only tell them to take a generation and come to me again. And it reminded Bridges that he was the priest's sole audience. You are my public, and I hope to convert you. I hope to convert you is, I think, a play on words. Hopkins implied he was trying to persuade Bridges of the beauty and propriety of his innovations. But crucially important to the Catholic priest was the state of Bridges' soul. For his Anglican case was faith was never orthodox, as seemed at times an atheist. And he was continually snide about Catholicism and the Jesuits, writing a friend about the posting of Hopkins to Oxford. Whether he's actually set to undermine the undergraduates steadily or not, I cannot say. Well, there seemed to be a denominational conflict between the Church of Rome and the Church of England, or between Catholicism and Protestantism, it was based, in fact, on the irreconcilable contrast between the Ignatian priest seeing God in all things and deeply concerned about our lives, and the Victorian scientist imagining the holy mystery at a great distance coldly uninvolved and either dead or dying. Hopkins, we shall see, sought to alter that view. Constrained and silenced on matters of religious faith that were so significant to himself, it may be that Hopkins sought to evangelize Bridges through his poetry, which joined this theology, the Christian vocation to be witnesses to Christ to all the ends of the earth, with mystagogy, instruction about the religious mysteries, God's grandeur, the wind over, pie beauty, are all examples of the analogical imagination that finds divinity expressing itself in the dearest freshness, in the mastery of a falcon's flight, in all things counter original, spare, strange. The instruction in his poems could not have been lost in Dr. Bridges. Indeed, the lantern out of doors, the loss of the Eurydice, the May Magnificat, and in honor of St. Alphonsus Rodriguez, were like a patient and uninterrupted catechism may have even seemed to Bridges an irritating schoolmasterish school assault, as they reminded the physician of a trinity of heaven and a way of living that he no longer believed in. Chiding him in a letter, Hopkins noted, 
As I am criticizing you, so does Christ, only more correctly and more affectionately, both as a poet and as a man. The 20th century American poet Wallace Stevens thought that, quote, in an age of disbelief, or what is the same thing, in a time that is largely humanistic in one sense or another, it is for the poet to supply the satisfactions of belief in his measure and in his style. Bridges strove to carry that out, but Hopkins would have scoffed at such a feeble and insufficient pursuit, for he knew that even the grandest poetry was a pale, scrappy, ephemeral description, a mere glimmer of an immensely grander reality. Art and religion were for him conjoined in their efforts to pray, give praise and glory to God, and Hopkins' poems are vital for us now in ways that his friends are not, because of the spirit filed certitude, fired certitude which he expressed what he had learned of the great mystery, sensually and in prayer. In 1884, at the age of 40, Robert Bridges retired from medicine, married a Quaker, and retreated to a manor at Yattenden, near Oxford, where he lived calmly but industriously with his contentments of literature and music. Within a few years, he would be nominated for the chair of poetry at Oxford, which he declined. And in 1912, he, with Henry James, was an awarded an honorary doctorate of liter literature there. By then, reviewers were so extolling Bridges as the greatest living matter, master of English verse that it was no surprise when Prime Minister Asquith passed over Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling to aim Robert Bridges, poet laureate of Great Britain in 1913, the first medical doctor to have ever received the honor. Whereas in 1884, a still unpublished Father Robert M. Bridges, Robert, excuse me, Father Gerard M. Hopkins, S.J., was sent to Dublin, Ireland, where he would spend the final five exhausting years of his life as an examiner in classics in the newly formed Catholic University College. The rift between him and Bridges widened, and his last melancholy poems, Justus Quidem to Est Domine and To Our Being, seemed to try to explain himself his needs and his hopes for their friendship. In May 1889, Bridges heard the priest was ill with fever and wrote a solicitous letter to Duras Gerard, praying he recovered quickly. On June 8, 1889, Gerard Hopkins died because has long been said to be typhoid. Writing of his death to a mutual friend, Bridges stated in a footnote, that dear Gerard was overworked, unhappy, and would never have done anything great seems to give no solace. But how much worse it would have been had his promise or performance been more splendid. He seems to have been entirely lost and destroyed by those Jesuits. I have a hard time not being hard on Dr. Bridges, but the fact is he was Hopkins' closest friend, his confidant, his dearest Bridges. And in spite of his meanness, prejudices, and condescension of Hopkins, he did indeed have deep affection for his friend. In spite of their religious differences, it may have been the peculiar chemistry of their literary companionship that inspired some of the